Hi and welcome. Uh, welcome to Curzon Living Room, a season of live Q&A events on Curzon Home Cinema. I'm Tricia Tuttle. Uh, I'm the director of BFI Festivals. Um, it is my pleasure to be hosting tonight's conversation with writer-director Claire Oakley about her debut feature Makeup and the film star Molly Windsor. If you're watching us live, we're going to be taking questions via, and via the comments on Facebook, Twitter, and uh, and also on YouTube and our Twitter handle um, is at Curzon Cinemas and you can use the hashtag at Curzon Living Room. I'm gonna read out as many questions as you throw at us. So get busy, um, send us questions your way and uh, yeah, we'd love to hear from you. So welcome to you both. It's so nice to have you here. Um, welcome, I can hear the virtual applause in our, in our home cinema. Um, so, I mentioned before I'm the director of BFI Festivals and um, it was our pleasure uh, last October, which feels like a million years ago, to host um, the world premiere of um, this really wonderful film. And I remember leaving the cinema with the other programmers and just being struck that we'd seen um, a sort of major new voice in, in British cinema in you, Claire, and also Molly, the performance is really fantastic. So really want to con congratulate you both on, on a great film. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> um, so let's, um, let me kick off, but um, I definitely want to um, take questions from the audience as we go around, go, go along. But Claire, I've read you talk really compellingly about sort of where the seed of this, um, this film, that it grew out of a short film that you were working on. Can you give us some, a little bit of background on where the idea started and how, how it developed into the script for makeup? Uh, yeah, so sort of nine or 10 years ago, I had a dream that really struck me and it was just, I was following a girl through some streets and I could like never quite catch up with her and never see who she was. Um, and I wrote that into a short film and um, took it onto a lab and this other director read it and he assumed immediately that it was a story about lesbian desire. Um, and at the time, that didn't chime with me at all. It wasn't anything I'd ever thought of in my life. Um, and I thought he was really weird and I didn't speak to him for like the rest of the week. Um, so then, but then, you know, things, I never made it into a sh short film itself. It always remained as, as a script. Um, and time passed and uh, about five years later, I came out um, and I looked back at that short film and what he'd said about it and wondered whether he'd been totally right. And I had somehow kind of unconsciously written something about lesbian desire or my own desires um, without realizing. And that was really enough of a spark to go back to the project um, and, and create it into something more. I was looking at, you know, repression and the way that your mind plays tricks on you, the way we hide from ourselves and um, the sort of how we can be fearful of our own desires. Um, and it grew into a feature um, into the, that you see now. And even then, I mean, it strikes me as a sort of deeply personal film in, in many ways. And I, I wondered whether even after you'd sort of come out, whether that was a sort of terrifying process to have to dig deep into all the repression and uh, and sort of create create this really wonderful story? Uh, it was quite exhausting. <laughs> um, and I was looking back, I looked back at kind of, I don't really write a diary, but I look back at the odd things that I'd written, um, emails I'd sent people around the time. And um, so I was, I was definitely mining my own personal experience. Although the film itself is not autobiographical at all, I wanted to have a set of fictional characters and a fictional setting and set of circumstances. So it wasn't kind of, I wasn't describing my own life, but I was very much describing the feelings that um, were real to me at the time. That was what was important. And at what stage is you use um, some of the generic con conventions of horror in such uh, fantastic ways? At what, at what point did you know that this would sort of be a key, a key part of the film? Um, well, I'd sort of given myself free reign to use any genre um, that I wanted. The main thing for me was to describe the kind of the unconscious mind and the desires and fears of this character. Um, so to do that, 
um, it felt quite natural to step into a more surreal uh, landscape with that. Um, the big challenge of the script was to kind of dramatize and visualize what was essentially a very interior journey um, and, and show her inner world. So using horror and thriller and um, some more surreal imagery kind of came from that. Um, and I was also interested in playing with audiences' expectations and using these tropes that are quite familiar to us, but in different ways. So, you know, using horror to describe someone's kind of deep inner feelings. Um, so, yeah, that was kind of how it came about. Great. Um, and Molly, um, was, was it the script that drew you to the project or was it the way Claire talked about it, a little bit of both? Um, what made you want to work with her on the film? Because I met Claire and Emily Morgan, the producer, before I'd read the script. And I think I met them and just interrogated them, <laughs> basically. Um, and then when you read the script, it was such a... It was filled with so much stuff and so much content that straight away I completely understood it and knew why it was really hard to describe. And um, I think you do have to really go with your gut. And as soon as I read the script, and I could see the world and I could see Ruth and... Um, it made me really excited. And did you, can you talk a little bit about casting Molly in, as Ruth? When did you know she was your Ruth? Um, I think I got really protective over her. Yeah. Um, and I think it is that I did have a, a kind of a switch moment of like, okay, I want this. I want, <laughs> I want yeah. to do this job. I, I want to to play Ruth. And I think that did come from reading the script, to be honest. Um, and then the casting process seemed to go on for a long time because I just I just wanted to get onto that caravan park and start working. And Claire, had you seen Molly in something that made you feel like she could um, be the Ruth that you were looking for? Um, I'd seen her in Three Girls. Um, and the, the, when I first sent our casting director, Olivia Scott Webb, the script, um, she sent me back a link to Three Girls and I watched it. Um, so Molly was always in our minds, but then we were very thorough with our casting process and saw like 200 young women. Um, and at that point, it was really Molly's casting tape um, that really struck me because it was totally different from any of the others. You know, it was very natural, very honest. Um, and for this character, I, that was like, you know, two of the most important kind of uh, building blocks. Um, you know, it was important that she was naive as well, because if she'd at all seemed sort of cunning in the story, I think it, it wouldn't have worked. Um, so, yeah, Molly seemed to just contain all of these um, aspects of Ruth that, that I felt were important. And then we met and um, I realized that Molly thinks very deeply about things and is able to um, understand a lot of, um, even if she's not experienced things herself, uh, to understand, you know, all sorts of human emotions and that we were going to work well together. So it was great. And, and Molly, this is a question for both of you, really. Um, there's just such great um, chemistry between Joseph, Stephanie, who who play um, Tom and Jade, um, respectively, and, and your character, Molly. And I wondered whether you guys had an opportunity to read together or whether you rehearsed the parts together. Um, what was that process like of, of create? Was that chemistry there immediately? Um, I think it, it all came pretty naturally. Um, and with shooting on the caravan park, it's kind of like one of those places when you're there, you're there. And we spent time together and, you know, you'd, you'd go out for dinner together and that sort of thing. Um, so, yeah, it, it just seemed to happen to me. Which I was really glad about because we didn't have any rehearsal time. <laughs> so the rehearsals kind of had to happen, you know, naturally by themselves. But, yeah, as Molly said, because we were all living on the park and working on the park in the middle of nowhere. Um, I think that really helped. 
Um, the, let's, let's, that's a great segue because I really want to talk about um, the location um, and so many of the sort of craft elements of the film as well to just have a sort of life of their own, almost a characterization of their own. Um, that holiday park in particular, um, you know, it's sort of so thematically resonant. It, it's really, really beautiful. But did you have a picture in your head of what that looked like, Claire? And um, how did you convey that to um, your design team and locations team? Um, well, our locations team was me and Emily, uh, my producer. So uh, it wasn't hard to convey that. Um, and we we spent um, over several trips, we visited every caravan park in Cornwall, Devon and Dorset that was on the coast. Um, so Emily and I had seen a lot of parks and then we ended up choosing the very first park that we saw, <laughs> which was uh, quite absurd. Um, but it did, the, the trips were actually really useful, particularly because I was meeting a lot of caravan park owners and that really helped build the character of Shirley and I was even using lines that you know we'd I'd heard in conversation with these some quite eccentric caravan park owners um but yeah thematically um it was a really exciting place to shoot for me because you've got these kind of prefabricated identical vans set in this sort of incredible raw unspoiled natural landscape um and that seemed to reflect the story for me where, you know, Ruth has to decide between whether she's going to live a prefabricated, quite conventional life or whether she'll, she's going to go off and follow her more raw, natural um, instincts. So I sort of felt that I was going to be able to express some of that story visually if we shot um, there. And the part that we ended up choosing is in this, in like six miles of sand dunes and it's got a huge beach and the Atlantic Ocean. Um, so, and, and the park itself um, was, you know, it, it can be, become quite maze-like, which was quite fun uh, because I knew that we could create this kind of creepy labyrinth in the film. Um, so, yeah. And it looks so beautiful. And I want to talk about um, how it looks, but also Adam um, Morling from YouTube has said to you both, congratulations on a mesmerizing film and asked you, Claire, to talk a little bit about the look of the film and in particular, the wonderful use of color um, and your conversations in your process on deciding uh, on what the palette and the texture of the film would be. Um, so I work, so the DOP, Nick Cook and I, um, we went to the location very early on um, together and actually we got snowed in there. It was when it was like the beast of the, from the east, massive storm. And we got snowed in and so we spent even more time there than we had hoped. Um, but it obviously looked quite different covered in snow. Um, but we kind of used um, the reality of the location um, as a, you know, first and foremost before anything um, and one of the things that we noticed was that, you know, it was quite pale, it's quite white, often a white sky, white caravans, you know, the beach. Um, and, but this story was about, you know, somebody's desires and dreams and fantasies. So I always knew I wanted to bring more color in. Um, and we saw, you know, on the edge of every caravan, there are these like bright red gas canisters. Um, and we had the idea to use red in a kind of thematic way to help tell the story. So um, only the kind of people who probably watched it, watched this film more than once would notice, but um, there's only red in the scenes where Ruth feels desire. Um, so all the early scenes with Tom are very gray and blue. Um, and as she meets Jade in terms of costume and um, the production design, we started putting pops of red in um, and then at the end of the film, you know, in the uh, party at the fire, like she's kind of drenched in red, you know, the, all the smoke is red. Um, so yeah, we kind of used that as a theme that we built on throughout the film. And then in the grade, we spent a long time just making all those reds like really pop. Um, but also for the look of the film, our main reference was a photographer that I love called Todd Hiddo. And he's an American photographer that photographs um, suburbia and it's always twilight and 
it's this it's got this kind of the air is like thick with mist and fog um and it's quite quite a nostalgic subjective feel um his his photographs are known for um you know feeling fe feeling more like a state of mind than a place um and that was really interesting to me because the story uh was really you know about describing her mind so we used his photographs as our main reference for everything really and Molly, um, when you were sort of building the character of Ruth, um, did Claire talk to you about all these sort of visual references and sort of set the mood and tone by showing some of the photographs and talking about the textures of the film? Um, we did so much talking about everything and Claire was great for me because it, it was like any kind of thoughts or, or feelings or I remember once we sat down and, and pretty much went through the whole script and and just talked about what was going on in Ruth's head. And I think that was more helpful for me than than thinking about a finished product of a film because you can't, it's hard to juggle both. Um, so it was great that we talked mainly about Ruth and, and at what state of the film she's aware of um, what's going on and, and that kind of thing. And Claire, we've got a question from Lucas via YouTube, um, and it's sort of going beyond um, talking about the caravan to really talking about the landscape and the, the way you use the sea. Can you talk a little bit about that as a sort of metaphor in the film? Um, yeah, well, I studied English literature and the sea is like, you know, always used as a metaphor for some big, deep emotions or our kind of soul or you know, base feelings. Um, so I think that probably like filtered into my head. Um, but I think for me, it was kind of a nice metaphor for desire or uh, your sexuality, because it's kind of exciting, but terrifying. It's very powerful, this sort of untamable natural force. Um, and, you know, there are points in the film where that becomes too much for Ruth. Um, and she feels sort of almost drowned by it. Um, and then, you know, the final image of the film is her kind of at one. I mean, Molly could probably talk about shooting that moment because it was absolutely freezing and she probably didn't feel at all at one in the sea, but it looks beautiful. <laughs> um, so yeah, for me, it was kind of a, a nice metaphor for her sexuality, her desires. Um, and right from the beginning of the idea it was always there and I sort of knew I wanted to to use it it was just took a while to work out kind of what the little arc of the sea was going to be so eventually I had the idea that maybe she'd never been in the sea before and she hadn't didn't really know how to swim so well and and that kind of you know grew into her trying to and and then the getting into trouble in the sea. Um, that also leads really nicely into a question from Simone from London, who um, complimented you on the sound design and the music, which I'd like to come back to specifically and talk about the music. But um, Simone asks about the rain um, and and how it, it, it can you talk about it? It's almost like a character in the film. Did you feel that about it? Um, and can you talk about the audio environment that you created? Um, yeah, the rain and the storm and stuff was really important to me and I'd written loads of it into the script. Again, potentially from like reading so much English literature, <laughs> um, that sort of idea of pathetic fallacy and it mirroring her feelings. Um, but then when we started shooting, you know, we made the film on a very low budget and I realised that, or we realised as a team that we couldn't actually afford any of the rain effects um, at all and that I might have had to have cut that whole element from the script, which would have, which, which felt sort of really detrimental to me and, um, and that it would change the whole story. Um, so in the end, um, my dad did all of the rain effects. Um, Is your dad a sound designer? He's not. Um, my dad was a builder, but we got him to set and he came with some hose pipes and very quickly kind of <laughs> managed to rig up some uh, some things. Like there are shots we couldn't use where the rain was like crossing each other. Um, but most of the time, you know, as you as demonstrated by the film, he did a great job. 
Um, so we were able to have all the effects that we wanted. And it was really important, um, partly also because of the sound design. And I'd written a lot of the sound into the script of the film. Um, uh, but I was, my whole idea of it was that it was going to start out very realistic um, and start to mirror her, um, her mindset. And as it as as her journey continued, it would become slightly more surreal, like the whole film does. Um, and you know, the sounds of the foxes screaming at the beginning would sound like foxes screaming, and and perhaps at the end they might sound sort of much more psychological or in, inside her head. Um, so I sort of had had this strong idea about the sound design, and initially we weren't going to use any music. I just wanted the whole film to be scored by the sound design and the weather and the wind um, but then in the end we did end up scoring it we started playing with it in an edit um, using some of Ben Salisbury's music um, from Ex Machina and Annihilation and his music um, often sounds quite like sound design he uses quite natural instruments um, and so we sent him the film and with his like little cues in and he really loved it and came on board and um, we started using instruments like the waterphone, um, which is this sort of 70s instrument that was created for use in horror films, but it's also been used to successfully call orca whales under the water. So it's got this like, you know, quite organic um, strange sound. So that was our main use, uh, our main instrument. Um, and we used some sort of flutes that he distorted and all sorts of other things. But it ultimately, um, all of the music sounds like it could be from the wind or from the rain. And um, it's, it sort of builds into uh, more of a melody at the end. But um, yeah, that was where the ideas came from. Um Madeline Casey on YouTube asks um, if you guys stayed on the caravan park. So Molly could answer this, but also um, did you get creeped out given the themes of the film? Um, when I arrived at the caravan park, Claire had said, you know, Ruth arrives late at night and it's all dark. Maybe you should do that. And I was thinking, OK, whatever, it won't matter. I got there and I was so freaked out. Um, and I, I was terrified. <laughs> and then like slowly the caravans kind of became like our homes, I guess. Um, so yeah, but I'd never stayed in a caravan before as, as a kid or anything. So it was like a baptism of fire, really. <laughs> How long were you on set at the caravan park? Six weeks, was it about six weeks? Yeah. What a, cle a very clever use of, um your low budget to sort of have your set also be um, location you kept all of your actors, I'd imagine, <laughs> and your cast and crew. Yeah, I, well, the, the last short film I made before this um, was on top of a mountain and we had to like hike to the location every day with uh, like cameras and lenses in backpacks and uh, we lost like half of our shooting day because of it. So I was determined to kind of maximize um, the shoot logistically and with the caravan park, yeah, it's, you can like drive to every single part of it. There's um, electricity across the whole park. Um, yeah, it's just, it's a really easy, good, and obviously yeah, you can house everyone, feed everyone. Um, so yeah, it worked really well. And, and the whole, there's one scene that was not shot on the park, which is in Shirley's sitting room. Um, but other than that, we were there, yeah, for, it was like a five week shoot plus a, a week's prep. Um, what was the um, most fun process, a part of the process for both of you of making this film? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, Molly, have you got one? I don't know. I mean, we did have a lot of fun, so it's hard to pick out. I remember at the um, premiere at uh, BFI Festival in London, Joe Quinn, who plays Tom, stood up on stage and said, you know, how much fun he'd had and that it felt like we were all away on holiday and that there were no adults there. And Emily, the producer, was like, hang on a minute, 
I'm the adult. I was meant to be the adult. Um, but no, it did, it did really feel um, like we all had a good time. And I think partly because a lot of the um, crew, a lot of the heads of department and everyone were kind of, for a lot of people, it was our first film or second or third. And so we were all sort of at a similar stage of our careers, um, kind of, you know, in some ways there were no adults there. Um, and it's just, just sorry, Molly, go ahead. No, it just felt quite magic the whole the whole shoot really. Um, even you know, there's part in the film where Ruth has a a bunny lamp, and then suddenly you're walking back to your caravan at the end of the day, and then there's bunnies everywhere. And um, you know, there was moments where we were all sat talking about love songs and and what were like our meaningful love songs, and you sat talking about a film that you really loved. Um, with really amazing people and the sun setting over the caravan park, the the whole shoot just felt kind of magical. Um, and the opposite, uh, like the the alter um, side of that question is, um, well, it's actually Kate Kate Langley from Facebook says uh, compliments you guys on um, brilliant performances for all that all of the cast, but um, in particular Molly asks you if there were any scenes that you found really challenging. Um, I think, yeah, every, every day felt like a new sort of mental challenge because Ruth's journey is so massive. Um, but I remember one scene where, um, Ruth is looking through the shower block and there was a shot of Ruth kind of coming down and opening all these doors and, and peeping in and to get the re reveal shot, um, there was half the crew kind of sat in a toilet cubicle together with a camera and it's one of the most tense parts of the film but to shoot it I, I just fell into pieces with the giggles and couldn't get out of it um, because it it was such a funny thing to open the door and, and see everyone trying to not look at you but be as small as possible uh, so that was a tricky one. I mean what about you Claire what was the most challenging part of the shoot for you? Um, I had a really hard time shooting the water stuff um, in the sea. Was, we left it right to the end of the shoot and we had kind of like a splinter crew. Um, but the way it was set up was that initially the um, actors and the camera and a cut and someone on sound, a few people would go in, into the water um, and we'd rehearse before on the beach and then they'd go into the water and shoot, but I wasn't there with them. And I, there was no way of communicating with any of the actors or the camera or anything. So it would sort of go away and shoot and I'd be stranded on the beach, unable to direct the scene. And then they'd come back and we'd look at the footage and and it was a really slow process of then trying to sort of change things or, um, and I that I felt really like helpless and like I wasn't, I, w I, would, I just wasn't doing my job. Um, so then I put a wetsuit on and, and went into the water in the hope that like that would change everything and I'd feel you know I'd be able to, to direct and very quickly realize that that was also uh, quite short-sighted because it was like a really rough day in the sea and however much I thought I was going to be able to be like no you stand there and let's get this shot and this um, angle it just there wasn't none of that happening um, the sea you, you shot an in entire short film underwater though once didn't you so we did, but there were no cast in it. It's just like beautiful landscapes underwater. That was lovely. That was lovely. And that was mostly no just putting a camera into a canal and just waiting. It was very calm. Um, but no, this it, it, it was really hard that. Um, and the following day we had to change it all. We Because we had initially been shooting on the North Coast and, the, and it's really rough. Um, and the following day we at the very last minute sort of found a new beach on the south coast of Cornwall where it was going to be much calmer and and went and shot there and it was much easier. Um, Jen from Peckham says that uh, she's watched more independent films in lockdown than she normally would have. Have each one of you guys found fil your film uh, viewing has been affected over the last few months? Have you discovered anything that you might not have uh, seen otherwise? She wants some viewing tips from you both, I think. <laughs> uh, I've been watching more TV, weirdly. I don't know whether that's because 
my attention spans got less or what, but I watched um, I May Destroy You, which I thought was incredible um, and want to watch it again. It's re- I, it just really blew me away. Um, and and uh, quite a lot of documentaries, um, but I'm writing at the moment and I don't really like watching films when I'm writing. I find it a bit distracting. Yeah. Um, Molly, what about you? Anything that you've loved and would recommend to Jen? I've just started, well, I've just finished Succession. Um, it was actually Steph Martini from Makeup who told me I need to watch it. Um, but like Claire says, your attention span, especially at the minute, I find it really hard to sit and um, I, I enjoy going to the cinema and, and kind of being in that immersive experience. Um, and also I've been watching a lot of David Attenborough's just to keep chilled before bed, quite relaxing. Yeah. And what are you both working on now? Or Claire, what, can you t- say anything about your new project? Um, yeah, I'm writing something um, for the BFI and it's an adaptation of a book by a debut writer called Laura Kay. It came out a couple of years ago. It's called English Animals. And I'm just uh, writing a draft of that. Uh, so yeah, hopefully maybe it'll be my second film. And I guess uh, there haven't been many gifts from lockdown, but maybe the opportunity to work on a script has been useful time for you. Yeah, it's been great. I mean, it's be, it's it's come at a good time for me. You know, we've finished the film. Um, it's still been released um, and I'm writing. So uh, I feel very lucky. Yeah. Yeah. Well, again, congratulations to you both. We've run out of time, but I um, want to thank you, Claire and Molly, for being here tonight. And um, Makeup is now available to stream on Curzon Home Cinema. So for everybody out there, if you enjoyed it, uh, be sure to tell people to go watch the film. Um, and a couple of upcoming things to tell you about on the 6th of August, we've got a and a with the directors and stars of White Lie, which is a drama about a woman whose life spins out of control after she claims she has cancer. Um, the event is part of the Canada Now Festival. And also a week later on the 13th of August, we have broadcaster Rihanna Dillon, who will be in conversation with Eva Riley, who has also made Uh, her debut feature, um, Perfect 10, um, which we're going to be showing. So follow us on Curzon Cinemas on Twitter and Facebook um, for updates on upcoming events. Um, I've been your host tonight. Thank you guys again and uh, good night, everyone. Thank you.